I've been a fan of ultra-portable laptops for as long as I can remember, but they've almost disappeared from the market since the appearance of smartphones and tablets. So I was very intrigued when GearBest.com recently offered to send me the GPD Pocket for review. I can only assume they're targeting the highly coveted Java Superfan demographic. Now it's true that this is a bit different from what I normally review, but I really wanted to see what a modern take on this style of computer might be like, especially because it has some relatively good gaming capabilities from what I hear. And I hope you'll be interested as well. GearBest did give this unit to me for free, but these opinions are my own. The GPD Pocket was originally offered as part of an Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign, which raised more than $3.5 million. Let's look at this graphic from the Indiegogo project page. It not only has luxuriant appearance like MacBook, but also super light and very small. It can be taken away at any time, like a mobile phone in your pocket. It can be taken away at any time? I can't say I like the sound of that. But what have we learned from this, aside from the fact that GPD needs a new copy editor? It's that they had Apple products like the MacBook Air in mind when designing this. But of course it is just a little bit smaller. Personally, I love the way Apple's laptops look, so that's not a bad thing in my book. And they actually have done a surprisingly good job mimicking Apple's industrial design here. The retail price of the Pocket is $599, although a lot of places are charging more like $500. That seems a little bit high, but you are getting something of a premium experience with the Pocket. The unit's made of metal and feels very solid in the hand. It weighs 480 grams, or about one pound, which is incredibly light for a laptop, but still slightly heavy for something you might want to actually keep in your pocket. And yes, it really will fit in many pockets, although whether you'd want to actually do that or not may be a different question. And, of course, opening it up reveals the screen and keyboard, but more on those in just a moment. Before we look at the unit's capabilities in detail, I just wanted to return to the idea of its size, because it is quite small, and it's difficult to convey that on screen. So let me compare it to a few things that people might know. This is the iPhone 7 Plus, and it's, of course, bigger than that, but it seems like it's sort of in the same range, much thicker and heavier, but... They'll both fit in the same kind of pocket. Here we have a iPad mini, and uh, not that different actually, much thicker, but in terms of size, uh, similar. Of course, the iPad mini does not fit in any pocket unless it's just a gigantic cargo pants pocket or something like that, so that is a difference. Since the GPD pocket is supposed to be a fairly good gaming computer, at least for a portable, uh, I thought it would be interesting to compare it to the Nintendo Switch. If you take the Joy-Cons off the side of the Switch, they're actually surprisingly similar in size, although the Switch is quite a bit lighter and a bit thinner. But of course you can't use it without Joy-Cons anyway. And of course there is one more item that I'm sure you've all been wondering about, and that is the vintage Jabba the Hutt figure. The GPD Pocket has the advantage of being quite a bit smaller than the vintage Jabba figure, and it won't get you the same kind of odd looks that you might get if you walked around with one of these Jabba figures in your pocket. Don't ask me how I know that. Here are some of the machine specs, if you're interested in that kind of thing. Of particular interest to me is the 8 gigabytes of RAM, which is quite large for a machine this size, and also the very high-resolution screen. I think it's worth looking at the ports in a little bit more detail. We have here on the right a USB-A port, so that's normal USB, a headphone jack, a micro HDMI port for connecting a monitor or TV, and the USB-C port, which is used for charging the device and also can be used for data. I was actually really impressed by the screen. It's very high resolution, but not all that big at only 7 inches. So it looks incredibly sharp. And it's got good colors, good viewing angles, as you can see here. You can basically see it from any direction. The only real issue is that it's very glossy, so you get a lot of reflections depending on the lighting in the room that you're in. They're actually using a tablet screen that they've turned on the side and then rotated within Windows software to be on its side. So there are a few places where that becomes an issue. But generally speaking, it's really good. Now the screen is also a touch screen. And I find that actually quite useful, more so than I thought I would, because I can just scroll a web page or something by swiping the screen like on a tablet. The touch targets in Windows are a little too small to use it all the time, though. Let's talk about this keyboard for a minute. Now it's obviously pretty small, but I'll have to say that the keys have a good amount of travel overall and actually feel pretty good. 
The main issue with the keyboard is its unique layout, like having the backspace and delete keys next to each other up there, and the tab above the Q on the left, which shifts all the number keys off from where they normally would be. Now this may not be a problem for you if you're not a touch typist, but I am, and it did take a little while to get used to. I used a program called Sharp Keys to remap some of the keys as well. My main problem with the keyboard, though, is this spacebar, which is split to accommodate this pointing device. And that means you have two space buttons. And if you're like me, you want to hit it right in the middle like this, but if you do that, it probably won't register. So you have to retrain yourself to hit it with one or the other side. One advantage, though, of having a split spacebar like this is that it makes it pretty easy to type with your thumbs, so you don't necessarily have to have the thing flat down on a surface to use it. This may sound like I have a lot of complaints about the keyboard, but actually I'm able to type on it fairly well. And having autocorrect enabled does help quite a bit as well. I find that I can type almost at normal speed for short bursts, but then I'll get tripped up by some punctuation mark not being where I'm accustomed to it being there, and that really takes me out of my stride. But still, a uh, surprisingly good keyboard actually, and I think if you use it enough you could get used to it. I'm not sure I'd want to write a book on this thing, although you certainly could. It's definitely more than good enough for emails, uh, forum posts, and things of that nature. Or even school papers. The onboard pointing device is this track point, which you often see on ThinkPads, and it has two buttons beneath it. Now these buttons are the same in feel as a keyboard key, which feels weird to me, and I sometimes get missed clicks because of it. The track point itself seems to work pretty well, Although I find it's a little bit too slow, even at the highest sensitivity. But it works pretty well in combination with the touch screen. Now I do have a couple of complaints about the Pocket. The first is about the battery life. If you look on the Indiegogo project page, it lists the battery life at 12 hours. And it's comparing it here to the MacBook Air and the Microsoft Surface. I haven't been able to get even half that amount. I've tried many ways to optimize battery life, and I still can only get about five and a half to six hours max. And if you're gaming, that amount will be cut in half at least, so maybe two and a half hours. That is pretty disappointing, especially when the machines that they're comparing it to actually do get around 12 hours of battery life. I have heard from other pocket owners that they get a bit longer battery life, like six to nine hours I've heard quoted from a couple of people. It's possible there's something wrong with my unit, but either way, 12 hours is just a fantasy. The other issue has to do with the headphone jack. I've had a repeated popping noise that sort of comes and goes whenever I'm using headphones, and sometimes it gets really bad where it's just popping every second and it makes any audio inaudible and, and essentially makes the headphones unusable. Other times I can use it for quite a while and it's just fine, so it's a little bit hard to figure out. I have heard a number of people say that they have the same problem. I think it's probably some kind of driver issue, so it could potentially be fixed in software, but I don't know that they actually have any kind of fix incoming. So let's talk about gaming. Before the Pocket, GPD released the GPD Win, which is a Windows 10 device about the same size as a Nintendo 3DS XL, and as you can see it has integrated game controls and is basically a gaming-centric device. The Pocket lacks those integrated controls, but it does have a bigger screen and actually a bit better specs, so I was interested to see how it would handle gaming. The TrackPoint pointing device is not great for most games, but you can use an external Bluetooth mouse or something like that. As I mentioned before, the keyboard's layout is a little bit weird, and it's fairly small too, so using a mouse and keyboard to control games can be a little problematic. But what you can use is something like this, which is the PlayStation 4 DualShock controller. Of course, it's almost as big as the device itself, so it does lose a little bit when it comes to portability, but you can set it up in Steam or with a program called DS for Windows to control just about any kind of game. So I'm going to show you a few of the games that I tried on the Pocket. Uh, this is Fallout 3. This was the first one I tried, and it may not have been a great first choice because, as it turns out, Fallout 3 has some issues running in Windows 10 and also, I guess, some compatibility problems with the Intel HD graphics that are in the pocket, but uh, if you do some patches and various things that fans have made, uh, you can actually get it running really well, and I think this is at least as good, probably, as the PS3 version that I mostly played before. I will say, though, that the common theme with most of the games that I tried was that they require a fair amount of tweaking and setup. 
before you can get them running at their best. So for most of these kind of games, I had to go in and not just select like the lowest graphic option, but also go into the detailed prefs, like go into a text file for, for this, and change a bunch of variables so that it was a little bit less taxing. I will recommend uh, Low Spec Gamer on YouTube has a lot of good videos about how to get things running well on low spec hardware. So unlike something like the Nintendo Switch where you can just pop in a cartridge and play and be assured that it'll work relatively well, you do need to invest some time and energy in, in setting these up if you want them to play their best. But on the other hand, it does give you a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, what kind of experience you want to have. One of the reasons I chose Fallout 3 as the first game to try out on this was that I'm just a huge fan of the Fallout franchise and the idea of having a portable device that could fit in my pocket that could play these games is just really attractive to me. And I'm, I'm really happy actually with how it plays now. I was also able to get Fallout New Vegas to work and I haven't tweaked this as much as I did with Fallout 3 so it's probably not performing as well but at least you can get some idea of what it looks like. Next, I decided to give Skyrim a try, and I originally wasn't even sure it was going to run at all, but I actually, after a lot of tweaking, was able to get it running fairly well. I did have to try a lot of settings and screen resolutions to see which would work. Many resolutions refused to boot at all, and I eventually settled on this 800 by 600 resolution, which sounds pretty low, but it looks really good on the screen, actually. The only issue is that it's not a widescreen resolution, so it doesn't fill up the entire screen, but it looks good. And I'm really happy to be able to have these games in a portable format. I am pretty interested to see how this stacks up to the upcoming Nintendo Switch version. One advantage that the Windows version that I'm playing here has is that you can use mods and things to improve your game experience and also your performance. I did also try a couple of newer games. I tried Fallout 4 and Star Wars Battlefront. I couldn't get either of them to even run poorly, much less <laughs> running well. Now, I have seen some videos of people running uh, Fallout 4 on the GPD Win, so maybe there is a way to do it, although I don't think you're going to get very good performance from it either way. I couldn't figure out how to do it. I'm basically a console gamer at this point, but I have built a Windows gaming PC back when Doom 3 was sort of the hot new game, and so I thought it'd be interesting to see how well it would perform here, and it's actually uh, quite good. You can run at pretty high resolutions, but when a lot of things come on screen, it falls down. So I had to knock the resolution down somewhat, but uh, actually very pleased with the performance on this one. Of course, I had to go back even further and try the original Doom, and that played just fine, as you might expect. Although I did find that uh, when I was trying some other games in my library that you, you can't really know for sure how any particular game is going to run until you actually try it. One example of this is Star Wars Math Jabba's Game Galaxy, which I reviewed on the channel a while back. It's a late 90s edutainment game, so it really shouldn't be taxing at all for a computer like this. But as you can see, the screen doesn't display correctly, with about a third of it being cut off on the right there, and I couldn't figure out any solution for this. I did see some proposed solutions posted on the GPD Pocket subreddit, but they were all kind of involved, and I didn't really have the time to really troubleshoot this, so that was a little bit disappointing. One thing that the Pocket is pretty good at, in addition to Windows games, is emulation. As you might expect, it can handle just about anything in the 8 and 16-bit era uh, consoles, from original NES to Super NES to Genesis and some of the more obscure ones. Nintendo 64 actually works really well, from what I can tell. I only tried maybe three or four games, but they played more or less flawlessly. The only thing is that when I tried to play them full screen, this happens. They're tilted on their side, and I'm sure this is probably related to that tablet screen issue I mentioned earlier. So I've been playing them in a window, but aside from that, works good. I didn't try every emulator that's available, of course, but I did decide to try the Dolphin emulator, which is for GameCube and Wii, and it's actually not too bad. It works more or less okay, except that it's a bit slower than it should be, which means that the sound tends to get messed up. But if you were playing without the sound, I'm not sure you would even notice. Before I give you my final thoughts on the Pocket, I thought I'd introduce some of the accessories that I've been using with it. 
I think one of the big strengths of this product is that you can use just about any kind of a computer accessory you want with it, including external hard drives and the like. I've been using a Samsung 128 gigabyte flash drive that you can just plug into the USB port there and have it basically plugged in all the time if you want. I have a number of Steam games installed on there. It seems to work fine, although you do have to make sure that you format it as NTFS or else some games won't work. This is a 240 gigabyte external SSD that I've been using, and you can use just about any kind of external storage you want. I also have this USB-C hub that has pass-through power here and three regular USB-A ports, which can be pretty handy in certain circumstances. I've already shown you this PS4 controller, although of course you can use an Xbox controller if you prefer, but I've also been using this Logitech Ultra Slim mouse, which uh, I think really goes well with this just in terms of its size and its styling. I did connect this to a monitor just to see what it would be like, and it actually works pretty well. You can use this theoretically as your main computer if you really wanted to. You can also connect it to a TV, as I mentioned earlier. That worked less well because of the overscan of the TV, cut off some of the image on the sides, but uh, still you can play on the big screen if you want. I've also been using this USB external DVD-R drive to watch some movies and also install some software and so forth. It doesn't require any additional power. Speaking of power, I've been using this RAV Power external battery pack, and it is able to charge up the pocket at least a couple times, I think, and it'll also charge while you're using it, which is nice. Uh, here we have the micro USB, which you use to charge, and then you plug that Type-C into the pocket. About the only thing specific to the pocket that I've been using is this carrying case made by GPD. It closes with magnets, and overall it seems pretty high quality. It's uh, faux leather, and it fits the pocket like a glove, although maybe it's a little bit too close-fitting because you can't actually leave this USB stick plugged in and close it properly, which is a little bit too bad. But otherwise, really nice. So what are my final thoughts about the Pocket? Well, I think, despite a few rough edges here and there, as I've mentioned, it is actually really well made, and I think it pretty much does what GPD set out to do. That doesn't necessarily mean that this is a good choice for everyone. In fact, I think it's a relatively niche device that would appeal to maybe enthusiasts of this kind of computer, like me, or to people who have specific needs to use Windows on the go. I can't help but think that the average person might be better served with a tablet or just their phone, but if you're the kind of person who is interested in this kind of device, it's definitely worth a second look. There are some affiliate links in the video description, so if you do decide to buy this from Gearbest, a small amount will go back to the channel. If you've made it this far in the review, the only thing I have left to add is thanks very much for watching.